Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, my guest is from the Maxima city of Mumbai. He is a skilled architect and an avid painter, an alumnus of the Kamla Raheja Vidyanidhi Institute of Architecture and Environmental Studies. He finished his BR in 2018. During this time, his thesis called Garden of Reconciliation has won numerous awards, which also include the National Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Thesis organized by the COA. This project has also shortlisted as the top 20 projects across the world in Archiprix 2019, for which Jay was the only Indian to be shortlisted in the history of this award. His projects have also been showcased at multiple forums in the country and outside, including the Gamzo Academy of Fine Arts in China. Jay has been working on a project in Nagaland since 2019 in close association with the indigenous tribes and the government body there. Working in such a remote area and many other such contexts within the country and outside has rendered a certain sensitivity to his perception of architecture. He has also worked as a teaching assistant for a year at Krivya with Rohan Shivkumar and is currently working as a senior architect with the renowned architect Samira Rathod in Mumbai. He is also an assistant tutoring a design studio at Sept Ahmedabad along with Samira Rathod. So this particular guest of mine for this episode is uh, well known already. Uh, his name is Jay Shaw. Uh, his uh, thesis project, the Garden of Reconciliation, has uh, um, has been published so well and has been featured in many forums across uh, the country in uh, universities in um, competitions in online uh, platforms, uh, many places. So I think in, the, in terms of the outreach, this project has uh, uh, seen, uh, has, uh, uh, you know, uh, gone to a lot of people and they have well received this project. It shows a certain amount of uh, uh, significance and a very uh, interesting project in terms of its conceptualization, how the design process was uh, um, executed and formulated. So many good things about the project and also a lot of things to take away from the project in terms of its uh, design process as well. So uh, hi, Jay. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, hi, Vivek. Hi. Thank you. Thank you actually for having me over. Uh, and uh, I'm actually very excited because uh, I've, I've seen the other episodes of this show and I think what you're doing is, is fabulous. So uh, thank you so much for having me. And like you rightly said, I'm also very, very surprised of how many people have actually gone through my project, which I had done for my thesis uh, in my undergraduate course at Kamla Reja. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of very gratifying to get to know that so many, it's, it's, it's sort of out, the outreach that the project has got has, has gone and reached so many people well, where it's well received, it's appreciated. Um, also a lot of criticism, but I mean, that's a part and parcel of, uh, of the whole game. But I think uh, overall, I think the, the whole sense of, of doing that project has been very fulfilling. So thank you. Thank you once again for having me over. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start off with this episode with uh, your presentation. For those people who are listening to the audio version of this podcast on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc., I'm going to request you to switch over to YouTube for the duration of this presentation uh, because this is uh, because you have to see this video on the screen, right? So uh, I think uh, with that presentation, we can kickstart our conversation after that. So over to you, Jay. Sure, thanks. Uh, so yes, I think the project that Vivek also was mentioning uh, at the beginning of the podcast uh, is my undergraduate thesis project that I did at Kamla Reja in 2019. Uh, with Rohan Shiv Kumar tutoring me, and the project is called as Garden of Reconciliation, Kashmir Conflict and the Architectural Practice. Uh, and I think this project uh, is very, very important in terms of the kind of subject that it looks at, because it looks at the conflicted region of Kashmir. It analyzes a variety of uh, cultural practices uh, and the positions that they've taken um, within this region, because we see that not many practices have actually, you know, done work in, in the context of Kashmir and Srinagar specifically. Uh, and then it analyzes all of these cultural practices to then see what is the best suited position for another cultural practice uh, like architecture, which obviously we are most associated with being architects now. Um, and the thesis also kind of takes our down up approach where it tries to study the lives of the people within this region, uh, studies the architecture, studies the social spaces, 
to be able to then devise a sort of method as to how the architect then enters a context of this kind. Um, just to quickly take everyone through uh, the whole process of the of of the thesis project, it was very important for me to actually go through the history because one uh, has been fed information about this context through only contemporary history that we either learn through school or or have been exposed to uh, exposed to through the media uh, and the news articles that we either read or see on the news channels, but. Uh, this misconception that we have that the, the conflict actually began post independence in 1947 with uh, the partition of, of India and Pakistan. Uh, one would be surprised to actually know that the conflict uh, finds its roots a century before that in 1846 when the British decided to pass over an entire parcel, a very, very large parcel of land uh, in the name of Jammu to the, uh, the king then, uh, the Dogras. Uh, in some sense, territorializing the sovereignty where there was a large parcel of land being governed by just one person as opposed to many rulers before. Uh, with that large parcel of land came, uh, obviously, its population and all of its subjects, uh, because of which a lot of minorities started to feel neglected and, and, and the roots of dissent actually come from there. Uh, but the movement sort of and the movement sort of gained momentum uh, post the independence. And, and that's why in contemporary history, that's the only thing that finds mention. Uh, so it was very uh, important for me to go back to then and, and read about the history then uh, and then sort of make a judgment of, of what the situation was like uh, within Srinagar at this point. Uh, also looking at Srinagar as a city, I think it's incredibly tenacious. Uh, Srinagar as a city is divided into three large parcels of, of land, holistically speaking, uh, where there is the, um, the boulevard, which is basically the Dal Lake, which I think most of us know about because it's the it's the is the image that flashes every time you either Google Srinagar or, or like a tourist decides to go to that place for a vacation. Uh, it's a beautiful lake, obviously, with a boulevard around it, flanked by, you know, tall mountains, high mountains, a lot of gardens all around, a lot of uh, religious spaces that one uh, gets to visit when they go to Srinagar. Uh, the second region is uh, the market uh, capital of the city, which is the Lal Chowk, which also has a lot of political importance. And the third is the downtown, which actually is the heart of the city, uh, where most of the people of the city actually reside and is a completely housing sort of uh, uh, oriented area uh, with very, very dense housing, uh, religious spaces, mosques, uh, grounds for prayer, etc. Just to quickly take everyone through the entire city, I like to call this part of the, of, of the research, the windows and the life of the city of Srinagar because I think it's only when you visit the downtown area is when you actually get to uh, sort of know of what the city is about, what the spirits of the people are about, how they're living their lives, what are the kind of, uh, you know, community sufferings that all of these people are going through. So I think it's, it was very important as a learning to just sort of walk through the city, talk to people, look at the architecture around. And just as a side anecdote, uh, uh, tourists are not sort of uh, allowed into uh, this part of the city, you need uh, uh, either a special permission to get there, uh, or you have to be somebody from the media who's going to report things within the city. So I actually had to, you know, uh, uh, mask myself as one of the persons in the media and, and take fake ID cards and, and, and uh, car tags to be able to actually enter this part of the city and, and document it the way I have for this thesis. Um, this, these are just quick maps that were made for all the three areas. So Dal Lake, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the Lal Chowk and uh, the downtown, which is the old city of Srinagar. Uh, the downtown actually is divided into two segments with the Jhelum in the center. So you have beautiful wooden bridges that connect both parts of the city. On top of Jhelum, so you'll have boats sort of uh, going through, through the water. You'll have mosques that are on the edge of the, of the river. You will have large grounds for prayer and a lot of dense housing. Uh, with uh, with a lot of daily commerce, daily social uh, socializing happening within this region. So I think it was very important to study uh, this part of the city. And, and the way I've studied this part is that I like to call all of these spaces that I've studied within the city a space of consent and dissent because one realizes um, that, uh, that uh, uh, Srinagar as a city is not very, very easy to live in because of the kind of conditions that have happened over the, over the past century or so where there are so many uh, sort of curfews, night curfews, bans, uh, that the movement within the city is, is, is very, very restricted in nature, where there's frisking, where, where you know, uh, you're not allowed to freely go from one part into another. Uh, so these spaces that one sort of then appropriates, the, the, the population of Srinagar appropriates and, and, and makes their, their, their into social spaces, 
I think it's very very important to study because then from there is where you where you really understand what the lives of the people here are like. And and the reason I call them spaces of consent and dissent is because all of these spaces are either being used for celebration, for processions, for protest, uh, for mourning of of deaths of loved ones, for discussing politics, for discussing daily lives. And I think that sort of layer that has been added now to all of these existing spaces within the city is is incredible. And I think just the study was such a big learning curve. Uh, just to quickly take everyone through this, uh, this is the Kantai Mola P, which was the first sort of space of consent descent that I studied. It's a very very old Sufi shrine made in walnut wood, uh, completely wooden carved. The insides have the typical paper mache work that one sees in Kashmir. And the structure is such that there are bags on on either sides of the shrine. Uh, there's a plinth in the front of it, uh, with uh, with uh, a, a chabutra, which is basically a little fountain where all the the birds sort of come, and they are fed. The uh, shrine also descends down to the river with with steps like ghats, and these are called as yard bells in 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 the local language. Uh, so the plinth and the yard bells actually become very important spaces for women because they're not allowed inside the shrine. So the women actually sit on these two spaces and discuss and gossip and you know talk of things, while the men actually gather inside the in, inside the Sufi shrine and talk of of politics. They pray together. Uh, they even decide of of how and when the next protest is supposed to happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think this is a very important sort of. Uh, Social space within within the city, and you will realize as as we move forward that a lot of these spaces are actually religious spaces, because uh, the other social spaces that we have within our cities, like say theaters, say parks, uh, shopping complexes, are actually appropriated in in Srinagar. So you have lots of old theaters that have now become army bunkers. You'll have shopping complexes, you know that that will have uh, uh, security personnel at, at every three meters, sort of. Monitoring every move of, of of the people moving within the city. So I think uh, people find their sort of solace. They find their uh, respite within these religious spaces where they are set free and where they are actually allowed to even speak their mind with other people who are suffering and going through the same thing. So I think that sort of community gathering is very important and happens within these spaces. The second very important sort of uh, juncture in 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 terms of the social life of the people here is their house itself and the housing colony. Uh, and I think because there are so many sort of curfews uh, and restrictions on movement, a lot of people actually find uh, themselves interacting with other people through their through the house. You know, so the house will have a lot of projections. If you look at the structure of the house, it will have staircases in the common areas and the the narrow streets flanking the house. Uh, these projections are called as dubs. So you have women actually participating in all the street processions in the protests and all from these dubs because they're not allowed to sort of get out of the house and be a part of any of these things. Um, They'll also be gossiping with another woman across the street through this particular opening in the house. They'll have openings in the kitchen, so where they're cooking, they actually even interact with people walking on the street while they're doing their daily activities. So it's very important uh, and and to understand these little nuances of the architecture that these guys have built themselves. No architect actually went and told them how the house had to be built, and I think this ingrained knowledge uh, of architecture uh, is very very important for an architect to to understand before he steps foot in a context like this because. I think we we usually have this sort of god complex of you know I'm the architect and you know I know exactly how things have to be done and I will tell you how to live better, uh, but I think it's these nuances that one then generally sort of neglects because of which the architecture and the state of architecture is what it is in this country at this point. Um, but I think it's very important to understand these things while you're studying the local context in the vernacular. Uh, so these are just some images of of the kind of streets and. The projections within the streets and the windows in the streets I was talking about, uh, and this is just a study of the vernacular which I was mentioning earlier. You know the stone that has been used for the heavy plinth at the bottom, the very frivolous sort of wooden structure on top with very small bricks which they call as Mughal bricks. Um, then the sort of lattice work that has been done in the wood, the bracing that has been done in the wood, and all of these materials are sort of very naturally available in the context, which is why uh, people find uh, uh, utmost comfort in building with these, and they also Proved to be very very stable in terms of construction because it's an earthquake prone zone again. So you know this kind of construction proves extremely beneficial when when you know one has to reconstruct a part of the house that has sort of crumbled during the earthquake, or for that matter even during the protests that happened between the locals and the the army army, army personnel and the kind of destruction of property that happens because of that. Uh, so I think it was a great learning to sort of look at the architecture and look at the detailing of the architecture in, in, through this lens. 
Uh, the third is the Jamia Masjid, and I'm sure everybody knows that every city has a very large sort of Jamia Masjid where everybody from the city sort of gathers on special occasions. So this is that Masjid uh, in Srinagar. It has a large courtyard in the center with a charbagh, uh, and the whole Masjid sort of encircles it. Uh, uh, concentric to this is another layer of markets where after prayer, a lot of people go and buy their daily supplies. Uh, and during Eid, like you can see in the picture, the entire city sort of gathers within this place. But uh, you'd be surprised that in the last, uh, I think, seven or eight years, uh, nobody has ever sort of gathered like this in, in, in the mosque because they're not allowed to. And even on Eid, this mosque is completely shut off. Um, and what you will notice very surprising about this particular building is that this has this particular building and even Khantai Molapi has a, has a pyramidal roof, which is very uh, sort of new to our understanding of Islamic architecture, or Mughal architecture for that matter. And you'll be surprised that this actually is a, is, is an influence that has come from Central Asia, from China, because uh, Kashmir actually even shares its borders with, with Central Asia. So this is an architectural influence that has come from there that has been appropriated for the context of Srinagar. And a lot of important buildings and religious institutions within this place have been made with these conical or pyramidal roofs that you see in the pictures. Uh, the Hazrat Bal Shine is, is another sort of religi religious institution on the banks of the Dal Lake. And here, what is very important, if you see the structure again, a charbagh with the, the mosque in the middle. Uh, and, and because it is so close to Dal Lake, it has a huge sort of area of steps that go down to the lake and the water actually becomes uh, one of the biggest social spaces within this place. Uh, so the men will first wash themselves before going into the shrine. The women will sit uh, in either boats or on the steps near, near the water with their feet dipped in, talking to each other, crying to, perhaps to each other if they've lost some loved one uh, uh, recently or lately. And, and a lot of these gardens are also being used as congregation spaces and as little markets. So I think this is what the life of Srinagar really entails. You know, you don't have sort of entertainment uh, like we do within our cities. The entertainment is just to meet other people uh, within these religious institutions or within the bags that are available for them to sort of gather in. Uh, the Kantagar, obviously, like I mentioned before, is one very important political sort of marker within the city because this is where Nehru actually stood for the first time and talked about plebiscite. And since then has been a very important political sort of standalone uh, within, within uh, the Lal Chok area, which is the market precinct. Post this is where all the government buildings sort of start within Srinagar and before this is the entire market precinct. Uh, so this becomes one big juncture be between where the downtown and uh, downtown starts and where, you know, all the, 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 the secretariat building and the government buildings within the city actually end. Uh, so again, a very, very important sort of social space and, and a lot of protests on a daily basis are being done here because this is one place that immediately catches people's eyes uh, and the protest is sort of well heard when, when somebody sort of comes here and talks about things. Uh, and the next segment it was obviously to start studying the cultural practices that I mentioned at the beginning of the thesis. And I think what is very, very important for one to realize as an architect is that we find our legitimacy to practice because we always have a client who's sort of appointing us to make something for them, whether that client is the state and you're doing state projects and infrastructure projects, or whether it is a patron who's coming to you to get uh, an institution made or a house made. I think the legitimacy to the practice comes because you have a patron because you have somebody who's who's giving that work to you but that sort of legitimacy is uh, immediately questioned in in a, in a context like this because the minute you enter for the, the general population there you are an outsider you are an indian and they are they are kashmiris or they are uh, you know from the kashmir region and i think one really wonders of who's to be blamed for that and obviously it is us because we sort of uh, alienated them to such an extent where we talk of them not as 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 people of India anymore, but but uh, people from Kashmir as if it was a completely different sort of region. And the problem with uh, the general Indian population, I think, Vivek, is that uh, we've always sort of considered Kashmir as a piece of land. For us, it's always been territory that we we need to have a strong hold over, which we need to have our power over. Uh, and we've never really thought of the people there and, and what the people there are going through or what they really want because they, we've, not, we've never given them a voice. So uh, I think the whole power dynamic not just uh, deteriorates the situation there, but, but the minute the architect also sort of enters with a position of power like that, I think he only oppresses the oppressed more. Uh, and I think it was very important for me to sort of understand that, that power dynamic and situation, which is why it was important to take a down-up approach 
to first understand what the people here were going through or what their lives were like uh, and then sort of move ahead and decide what the thesis really had to do so i think all of these cultural practices were very very important to study and a very focal point of the research of the project so we have nilima sheikh who's an artist we have kavita pai a filmmaker sumit dayal a photographer masood hussain an artist tani manik shaw journalist and except mr masood i think everybody else is from the context outside of shrinagar or outside the conflict region but the way that they enter the region is so sort of sensitive and so subtle that they find themselves working with the general masses within that particular context very very easily so nilima actually brings a lot of artists and craftsmen from kashmir on board to be able to make the large scrolls on kashmir that she's making to tell the story from aga shahid ali's poetry uh kavita pai herself moves through one house into another and moves through the entire landscape of 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 uh, of uh, kashmir actually not even just shrinagar but a lot of other towns in kashmir to document stories of of half widows of of women that have uh, lost their husbands or women whose husbands have been taken away and they've never returned but they don't know if they're actually dead or whether they're still in police custody and where they actually are within within the entire system of of you know uh, captives within within shrinagar uh sumit dayal is from kashmir but sort of uh, flees from the context because of the uh, conflict and then uh, comes back when he's almost like an adult to find his roots within within the region and actually then starts documenting the kind of appropriation the army does within the region which was one of the reasons why he he and his family actually had to flee and and go to nepal so that is some sort of uh, sort of entry point he has into the region masood hussain gets actually people and artists from outside to work with budding artists within the within within kashmir to actually get them the knowledge that they lack because i think resources in kashmir are very very sort of uh poor compared to the rest of the uh, the country freni again who's a journalist goes and documents a lot of these stories of suffering of of uh, two two actually groups that are not very well documented in the region because we always hear of protests and men being a part in the face of their protest but she documents stories of women and children um uh, within this within this context and it's just heartwarming to sort of read through this and understand that you know like we are so sort of detached and distant from this entire reality that that makes their daily lives that you know one finds themselves really helpless uh in 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 a situation like this and then one really wants to do whatever they can and i think that becomes a starting point then for the architectural practice here uh, and even for the program I, i you know it was very important for me to not say okay this is because i'm an architect let's let me decide what the programs for this particular building are going to be uh it was through interviews it was through a lot of chatting with with people there uh that i actually got to know what their aspirations were like one understands that during uh the conflict there are three major things that suffer the most the ed- uh, education obviously suffers the most because schools sh- shut down healthcare suffers the most because you know you don't have reach to a certain kind of healthcare which is very very necessary in 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 a region like this and it's not just physical health care but also is mental health care that one requires because if you are if you are living in a context with so much sort of mental trauma on a daily basis i think that is one very important health care that one requires but just doesn't exist in in srinagar uh, and the third yeah can you can you zoom into the slide a little bit uh, so that we can see a little bit of the corner sure sure yeah. Yeah. uh and the third obviously being uh, jobs and the economy because one really uh, realizes that you know there are no jobs because everything is shut down there's loss to property so i think these three became a very important sort of starting point of of what the program was going to be and then obviously it was uh, uh, validated by the people there so the way the whole uh, sort of uh, matrix was made was that the program was written down what the role of program was going to be was written down what the active group was going to be uh, was jotted uh, the age of the active group the scale of the built form the connotation attached to it so if there's a school it obviously had to be education but what else could it be uh if it was a mental health center how else could you know you garb the mental health center uh, along with other sort of functions so it became more palatable for people living in the context to come and sort of use uh who was going to fund it what the sphere of influence was going to be whether it was only going to be just a particular community or like a housing uh, colony or whether it was going to be the entire city that was going to use this program and became a city program uh so all, all of these things were sort of looked at in detail to be able to uh decide what the program was going to be and then the program uh and the design was sort of done so it wasn't something that you know was a bit more fancy of the architect or we or me for particular in this particular context uh before designing <clears throat> before starting that design actually 
and this is the site which is the which is the Eidga ground which is actually one of the largest grounds in the in the city of Srinagar the road that flanks this ground actually connects the south of the city to the north of the city and even the airport so one has to sort of pass through this particular part of the city to be able to get into the next i think because of which it becomes a very sort of focal point in the city for everybody around and also is a part of the downtown region and one of its peripheries so it's very easy for people from the downtown to also access this um and interestingly this this ground is divided into three large sections right now the, the topmost section which is the yellow that you see has a has a very very old uh, unesco heritage mosque called the ali, ali jan mosque so it's used as a prayer, prayer ground the bottom half uh, which is in green is actually a park a public park completely vandalized at this point because there's no uh, program attached to it there's encroachment happening on the ground and the central portion with the martyrs graveyard is actually used as a protest ground so you know you have protests that have been registered and have had permissions to actually come out and, and show their sort of dissent and anger and those guys come here to show their protest and their their disagreement with the government or the military forces etc so one realizes that this whole context actually has four uh, very very uncoordinated sort of actors one is the general public uh, one is the military forces uh the third is the state and the power that the state has and the fourth are the liberation fronts and i think uh, the only thing that can actually even uh sort of help in a situation like this is some sort of reconciliation some sort of dialogue between these four uncoordinated actors and to actually even say that architecture is going to solve a social reality like this i think is is a huge blanket statement and i think for architects it's very important to realize that while architecture uh uh can be more than being instrumental and can be more than doing just the program it's been assigned uh, and i'm sure it gives a lot of experience it gives a lot of sort of it changes your perception but architecture also has certain limitations and it cannot solve social problems you know it it probably can help but it cannot be the end solution to a social problem because because one has to realize that architecture just does not have that power and the architect doesn't either So you know that was one very important learning again while I was doing this sort of thesis, and even Naval and for that matter, uh, when I was working in a context of that sort, that you know while the architect can can come in in their fancy cars and say okay I'm the architect and one line that I draw on paper actually gets converted to that line on site, you realize that architecture doesn't really have the power of changing social social uh, conditions, social social situations within within the kind of complex uh, uh, context that we live in. you know in the context uh, the complex realities that we live in but uh, having said that i also believe that architecture is just not instrumental it is just not about the program that's been assigned to it and i'm sure architecture provides for experiences that can have uh, uh, the capacity of changing one's perceptions and one's feelings and one's uh, you know like moods about about uh, when you're moving within that that piece of architecture or that space um so just a couple of master planning options uh and uh, uh and methods of attaching the building to either the mosque to give it some sort of validation because of the religious institutions that it was attaching to or whether the building should actually become the physical boundary between the three parcels of land and the different functions that i spoke of uh and one then realized that none of these actually work because that the the parcel of land was huge to be able to connect two buildings that were so far off and then one really turned to what the context was like and what was existing on site and 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 then i realized that there was already a martyrs graveyard which was a charbagh and the charbagh was actually a typology from all the space of consent and descent that you see that became the most important social space for all of these people living there and they were so sort of well accustomed to that particular typology of the garden of architecture uh, that something like that made again within that vandalized park would give not only purpose to the park but it would be very very sort of palatable for the people living in the context to come to and use so i think that was one of the positions i took and then started designing the building uh this is the drawing uh, that actually has been the face of a lot of outreach projects uh, and and programs that this project has gone to uh so um, this is the miniature drawing that i made for my entire proposal and i think one of the reasons that i also chose this particular style of representation uh was because kashmir is actually full of these you know like all of the the gardens that you see the charbags that you see the mughal gardens or even the mosques that you see they have in some sense always found themselves represented in the mughal style of painting which is the miniature painting uh and i think it was very important for me to then use those 
uh, those sort of that imagery that that came from the site itself to be able to then express the project, the colors that came from the site itself to be able to express the project, the kind of vegetation and the trees that were there, the the form of the leaves, and a lot of these smaller nuances that one finds very difficult to capture when they're doing you know like a, a project in in academia uh the, it, it just became very very important for me to be able to uh sort of absorb all of that and then put all of that onto paper which is why the result is what it is uh and this is just the whole sort of proposal and I'm, i'll quickly just go through the proposal because i'm realizing i'm talking too much and taking too much time but this is the whole charbag the charbag then was sort of punctured with the water body in the center so it became more sort of edges where interaction could happen along the water uh then the buildings were sort of placed on it where some of the buildings became a wrap around the charbag some places became a folly in the middle of the charbag some places were parallel to the whole axis of the charbag uh then the whole sort of vegetation and the movement also was designed such that you actually sometimes were on the periphery of the garden sometimes in the middle of the building sometimes amidst the landscape sometimes on the water edge sometimes actually on the edge of the martyr's graveyard or on the edge of the housing colony so one round through the entire garden sort of gave you so many experiences while walking through the entire design uh then there were two plazas made and i think the the climate in kashmir is very very pleasant most of the time of the year so those plazas could really really be used for a lot of activity outside uh and at the end there were obviously the landscape and the smaller pavilions that were used to hold that particular large landscape areas that then kind of finished the whole uh design and each parcel of landscape was also very particularly designed were uh, keeping in mind the kind of program that was close to it or was in the middle of it or was around it so uh, quickly going through the the ground floor plan uh if you see here this is the main entry to the garden there are also multiple other entries to the garden from other sides this becomes the school building this is a large library and an archive and one realizes that there is no such building in the entire of shrinagar there is no city library and and for a context that has been so ever changing and there's so much happening on a daily basis it becomes very important to document this because like you see that a lot of contemporary history that we even read today is so biased in nature that you always need something which has been archived and documented first hand to be then able to tell the story correctly of what is happening in a context like this uh this was a pavilion made which could be used as a market in the day but also could be used for a lot of political rallies for gatherings for meetings because this also was a, a protest ground uh, beyond the garden and then also acted as a buffer to where the garden was if there was a protest acting uh, happening here nobody from the protest could immediately get into the garden and start vandalizing the property there or scaring people there so you always found a little safe haven for whoever that came to this particular garden to be able to enjoy their little time of solace this here is the martyrs graveyard at the back and this was a sort of memorial made for the martyrs graveyard uh this is the mental health center i hate to actually call it that but just to say that it's a health center uh, would not do justice to to why this building was actually made and i think it's important to talk about these things uh, especially in in times like this uh and this was an empty theater that was made because one realizes that all the theaters are appropriated so where does one even go for entertainment and there's so much sort of art music theater that now is budding in in the youth of uh, of kashmir that they just need a space to be able to protest through all of those mediums peaceful mediums as well and i think this becomes one space for that uh quickly going through all the buildings this is the the health center the health center was designed as a building with a courtyard in the center it had facilities for all the women to come with their children so there was a crash there the whole structure of the the building was such that there was stone sort of uh, volumes at the bottom and there was a very frivolous sort of wooden structure on top with lots of dubs so the women could always interact with somebody in the courtyards very very easily through this sort of structure of the the projections uh the treatment here was also such that it wasn't so much of medical treatment than than actually uh providing help uh, through uh teaching vocations because one realizes there are a lot of these women that go through mental trauma also because they've lost their sons they've lost their husbands they've lost the only supporter that they had in their lives economically uh mentally and physically that they need to be taught some sort of vocation to be able to handle themselves and earn a little living to be able to live and support their children thereafter uh so the whole idea of making the center was to, was providing for them providing treatment to them through teaching them certain vocations also the fact that just that they could come here out of their house uh, away from from their family from their in-laws Uh, and and meet another woman who's gone through the same suffering and then just the dialogue between the two of them could be so therapeutic in nature 
because that's sometimes the only thing that you need you know just a conversation between two friends to be able to talk about how my day was and what i went through so i think that was the whole general sort of structure of of what the building was like there also was a large sort of orchard that was made under the building uh figuratively speaking uh where these women could go work uh they actually worked in the orchard they plucked out all the fruits and they got those and sold them so you know you always have a generation of income while they also getting their treatment here and they don't have to worry about their kids because they can get their kids either either to the school which was right next to it or they could keep them in the crash very easily there also were dormitory facilities for them to stay here uh and the whole process of designing all of these buildings were not like okay let's make a plan let's make a design let's make a form i think all of these forms were derived out of, out of a certain system of actually writing small vignettes of stories and imagining people within those spaces and and the nuances that the spaces offered so just to quickly read one of the stories saima hurriedly calls out to nazima as she sees the women, the women leaving for their picnic through the jali in the corridor nazima says a goodbye to her son's picture before she leaves she lost her son a year ago to pelleting in zaina khadal so just the imagination of this woman actually being in the dhab with the lattice work actually looking down to the courtyard having another woman who's calling to her and saying okay let's go let's leave and now she's finally found a friend was enough of an imagination for me to start designing the building and start designing the nuances in the building so if you if you actually look at the design each and every window each and every fenestration has actually been designed with a story in mind and that became the whole process of designing all the buildings in the garden uh the school building again uh i think schools are very very important in a context like this because they're not cocoons like how we are used to you know in in our context where you know our parents always tell us the school is the most safe environment where you are going to learn and all uh the kids here actually have to go through fisking they have to go through lots of level of checking before they actually reach their school on a daily basis so you know just to say that the school is a safe environment for them uh would completely be negating what the social reality in a place like this is so the school sort of has to embrace what the reality is and then offer what they have to to the children so i think children here interact with people outside much more uh, uh you know much early on in their age than we do when we are going to school so the 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 way the school also was designed was such that there were two wings uh, attached with bridges so every time you went from one sort of volume into another you always were out in the bridge looking down to either the courtyard or the larger garden and whoever was passing through the garden always had a chance of interacting with these kids so the learning not only became within the classroom but also in the outdoor areas you also gave the freedom to the to the child that after class he could just run out of the classroom and go to the the edge of the water body or go into the large sort of garden and do what he had to and then come back whenever the next class was so it wasn't such a safe environment but it was an environment of actually freedom which these kids usually you know don't really have in a context of this kind uh, again stories were written to be able to design the whole school and and you see what the school is like uh the library building and i think because i was making a city sort of program and a city building it became important to be able to uh highlight the central asian influence that has come from uh china and and sort of uh, expand it uh make it huge in scale to be able to make the buildings so the whole building actually is this wooden lattice pyramid with a central core which is the core where all the books are and then you have all the other space which becomes a reading space you have the library sort of tucked in uh, sorry the archive sort of tucked in and you have these large mounds that sort of rise up to the entire pyramid so the minute you get, you grab a book you have an opportunity of going out and actually sitting out in the open and read and find a little corner for yourself in um, um, amidst the landscape uh, if you don't want to sit inside actually and and read uh, and because like i mentioned earlier that the 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 weather in kashmir is such that it allows for this sort of outdoor activity because it is pleasant that one has the freedom to you know find themselves a spot and in solace in in peace sort of read uh what they really want to uh this is the library building again quickly going through all the joints and then the other two very very small buildings the market and the memorial like i mentioned the market was this sort of pavilion again made in in the vernacular where it was all wooden made with shingles and and slate on top for the for the snow uh it became a plinth for a lot of rallies for a lot of functions eventually later in the day and things like that and the memorial i think was very very important because one realizes that there is no or uh, acknowledgement of of how many people actually lose their lives uh because of the of the conflict you know and and then there's no opportunity given to any of the families to actually even mourn the deaths of their loved ones 
so this memorial was made such that it was a long axis that went to the to the to the uh, already existing graveyard. It was imagined as this thick stone wall with all the programs sort of embedded within. Also, it was the concept of the columbarium because the women aren't allowed to go into the graveyard. So how how does the woman of the house actually mourn the, the, the death of the loved one? And, and one realizes that a lot of these people actually have niches within their house where, you know, they keep either a picture or they keep like a little uh, a little souvenir from, from that person, uh, which, uh, which helps them remember that person in fond memory. Uh, and this was just sort of made larger in scale and made uh, into, this, into these two walls with lots of these niches where all these articles of remembrance could be put and, and women could come on a regular basis to remember their loved ones, to grieve them, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, and was amidst uh, uh, an entire rose garden. So you could very easily sit amidst this entire flower garden uh, and, and, and talk of, you know, uh, the ideas of loss. So it doesn't have to be grim. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'm crying and it has to be like dark and dingy. But, uh, you know, this is how you embrace life. And this is how, uh, and this is the kind of resilience that I have learned even from people there where, you know, for them, the life continues, every day continues, and, and this is a part of the every day. So, you know, this is this is the whole sort of ideology that was also imbibed in the design uh, of making all of these all of these buildings and the entire landscape that was around it. So this is the whole unfolded elevation of the entire design and the garden with all of these buildings and the scales of these buildings. And a lot of a lot of sort of text around it, which is something that we are used to hearing on a daily basis, something that I heard while I was there something that I hear when I'm in Bombay and I'm talking about Kashmir to people. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just like a lot of conversations. The whole point of the thesis was to start this sort of conversation with somebody who doesn't know the context really well. Uh, and obviously start conversation between the four uncoordinated actors within the region that I spoke of. So all of these buildings will always have some sort of opportunity of people coming from outside, then talking to people from within the context uh, to the, then the larger state power. Uh, is what the imagination was. These are just quick uh, images of the model that were made for the thesis. It's a really, really lovely project. And I, have a, I just want to make a few uh, of my own comments here. I think to this project, it doesn't only just uh, you know connect to the social, cultural, and political dimensions of the context, but also hits you really uh, strongly in at an emotional level as well. Um, it uh, there's I would say to this project the strongest pillars that I would say are you know the the good backing of the amount of research that you did, and also the beautiful illustrations and drawings that you had for this project. And then the third one is the narrative that you had for this entire project, which all ties it together. And it's really well presented in that sense. And a lot of work which went from your side as well. So first of all, congratulations for doing such a commendable job on this particular project. Thank so, you, thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to know, you know, a little bit more behind, behind the scenes of this project. So hmm. how many days or weeks did you camp in Kashmir before, uh, you know, you went back to college and started the project? So actually the way that uh, thesis is done in Bombay and all the colleges in Bombay that are affiliated with the university here is that we have uh, the research a part of the thesis being done in our ninth semester mm -hmm. and the design of it being done in the 10th semester. And while you're doing the research, you also have obviously all your other classes going on at the same time. So we had an architectural design studio, we had all our construction services, everything that was going on simultaneously while we were researching in this project. So uh, I actually didn't go to Kashmir before college even started. I went while college was on and I went twice and spent about a week each uh, yeah. while I was there uh, researching and, and just roaming around the city and, and sort of observing all of these things. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, that's about that, uh, of, of 15 days. Okay. Yeah. And then when you started the project in your, in your 10th semester, right? Uh, yes. So how many... Um, like, do you have uh, a set number of uh, points that you, like from the research, did you have to synthesize that immediately or could you continue your research or uh, how did that transition happen from the ninth and 10th semesters? So I think the transition, Vivek, to be very frank, wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't such a difficulty for me because I think I was very clear since the beginning 
uh, that I'm not going to pre-decide of what the project is going to be. I'm yeah. going to take it one day at a time. I'm yeah. going to look at all of this matter that I've sort of gathered uh, in an entire semester of doing research and then and then see what, you know, like what comes out of it. And even if that meant that just a small little garden was necessary out, out of that project, or say, for example, a large sort of government building was necessary out of the project, I would allow myself to do that. And I think that is something that a lot of colleges don't really allow their students to do because I think in the beginning of the semester only they're asking, okay, yeah. what is your program? What exactly are you going to do for your thesis? Yeah. It has to be a large building. You know, you can't do like a small little community center. And one really wonders so why, you know, like why is it so important to be, to, to give so much stress on what the program is rather than what the argument or what the hypothesis of, of the entire project is going to be. And I think it's the argument that, that it really is of utmost importance because uh, agreed that as, as architect, we need to know the craft of, of building and of designing, but uh, with architecture also comes a lot of social responsibility. And, and I think for that, you're, uh, you have to be very well aware of the kind of positions you take as an architect before you start building. So for me, I think this transition came very naturally because I think the thesis also was very sort of done in an intuitive manner where I said, okay, let's visit. Then from the visit came a certain things. Then I said, okay, let's talk to this person. Let's go and read this book. Or like, let's do a little bit of internet research of how Kashmir is represented in, uh, in cinema or like how it is being represented in literature. Uh, and, and then make sort of my own understanding of, of what was wrong with all of those representations or what was correct with all of those representations. And I think because it was so sporadic in nature, one thing just, you know, like uh, helped the other that, that was supposed to follow. And I think that's how the whole project was designed. But uh, to talk of transition necessarily, I don't think there was a sort of transition. It was very natural in terms of uh, the way one moved from one to the other. Yeah, I think uh, it's bang on and you hit it right on the nail because when you said, you know, people come up with this program and then they work on it. And that's exactly why I asked you this question, because when you were uh, explaining your project, I could understand that, you know, it was, it was, it was just trying to absorb the context first. And then you are slowly evolving with the project. What can be done and how can we take this forward through the project? So in that sense, the approach and the design approach itself is different, you know, when in comparison to the many other thesis projects that happen in India. Right. So that itself, I think, is a very unique point to the project. Um, I also wanted to know um, when you were designed, so did you have any help like from your junior? Because this is a monumental amount of work that you did in terms of the number of drawings, in terms of the number of illustrations, or even the model that you're showing us right now. Mm. Uh, did you have any help? that you do you have like some of the juniors helping you doing this project or what was it was it solely you uh i think to be very frank uh the drawing work is completely me because i have a huge ocd problem and i cannot like deal with explaining people as to how one little tree has to be exactly in the place that it has to be in mm -hmm. so uh, i could not let the drawing work uh, be handled by anybody else so all the drawings that you see right from the research to the final thesis presentation are completely done by me. But yes, I have to be honest that I had a lot of help in terms of making the model, which also, if you see the model, all the buildings have been made by me. They were obviously laser cut, uh, but they were all sort of uh, made uh, by me. Uh, but the entire landscape was made by a lot of people who have been very, very lucky to have had as support and as helpers with the entire process. I had like a whole army of 15 people just sitting and making trees. Uh, two people out of that just sitting and putting these little little lotuses in the in the pond, so that we have been I've been extremely sort of uh, lucky, and I'm very thankful that I had those people to help me with the model at least. How many days was the duration of this entire thesis? Yeah, the whole the semester is about for four months, five months. Your uh, thesis semester. Uh, the tenth semester, yes, about four four and a half months, which is when the main design was conceptualized and then done. And the research also was prior to that for another four months. Correct. Okay. And uh, was it like every day, like, was it like every day you sat on your thesis project and there was like something or the other to do, or were, were there like moments of reflection? I'm like, I'm, what I'm trying to say, uh, ask is, was it like a continuous driven process or was it like back and forth where you had to go back and reconsider that and then, you know, make changes and then go again? So how was it like a very clear and straightforward driven process or was it like back and forth oscillation? 
I don't think it was straightforward at all, actually, also because of the kind of context I was dealing with and being somebody who's not connected to that context closely, uh, it definitely was a very, very sort of back and forth process because once uh, you start to sort of uh, indulging in this sort of research, start doing it, get so engrossed and involved with whatever, whatever that you're doing, uh, with that also comes a certain amount of self-doubt of whether you're doing it correct or what people are going to say or how people are going to respond because everybody in this country has very, very sort of strong opinions about this context per se and the conflict. So, you know, at, at some point I was, I was in constant self-doubt of what if, you know, the juror that comes uh, tells me I've either not read enough or, or the juror comes and says, okay, your point of, 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 of like your opinion or your sort of uh, whatever that you've thought of is completely wrong. And, you know, how can you say this about the government or how can you say this about the army and, and everybody from there is the terrorist which also sort of happened at every step and, and, and not, to, uh, not to say didn't, but I think the more and more that I sort of started giving myself to the project, the more I went back, read something, came back again with, with all my homework. And I think then it started becoming clear to me of what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then I also had answers to, to be able to give to people that had questions. You know, because a lot of people had questions about why you're doing this or, or what is going to come out of it or, or, you know, you're not even from Kashmir, then who gave you the right to do it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, um, and this is what I've been telling a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people that even ask me uh, uh, this question about thesis is that you have to realize that with thesis, like unlike any other academic project that you're doing, you have to survive for a year. You know, all your other academic projects are just four months, which means that you can half-heartedly do something and just get done with it. But with a, with a thesis project, and if you really want to do it well, and if you really want to, you know, investigate in, in what you're compassionate about, you have to survive with it for an entire year. And I think to be able to do that, you really, really have to give yourself to it. And you have to, it has to be an indulgence. It has to be something that you have to think about 24-7. And only then is it really going to happen. So I think that's how the process was for even me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, it definitely wasn't something straightforward. I always had to go back and, 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 and reconsider uh, things that I was thinking of. And I think Rohan himself has been a great, great help mm-hmm. in, in, in doing so. Because he just like, he, he threw me out there and said, figure it out, but come back and tell me what you have. Mm-hmm. And when I did, he would just give me a little bit of like, you know, a little, a little finger and say, okay, this is what you should now think of. And, and then I thought of that and then I came back to him. I think having a really good tutor and a guide really made a lot of difference. How many interact, how many sessions did you have with your guide um, during the entire course of the thesis project? So I think the, the kind of relationship that Rohan and I had is, uh, is, is such that every time I thought of something and every time I was, I was you know, I had like something that, that clicked and I said, okay, fine, this is something that I want to know more about. I would perhaps just like call him up, text him, meet him in college. Uh, and we just sit down and have like five to 10 minute discussions max. We've never had like a lengthy discussion about anything, but I think that five to seven minutes was good, good enough for me mm-hmm. to have uh, another week's time to be able to figure out what, you know, my argument was really going to be or what my position was really going to be. So I think lots of discussions like those uh, on, 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 a, on, a, on a daily, weekly basis is what has resulted this thesis to be what it is. Mm-hmm. When you were traveling in Kashmir, did you see um, any modern architecture over there? Did you see any advancements happening in terms of construction or any recent development happening in Kashmir in terms of modern architecture? Uh, I think to be very frank, none at all. And whatever that there is, is also uh, the the government infrastructure that exists there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And all those buildings that also were made uh, right after independence for the government and for the state of power and things like that, those remain the way they are. Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been any substantial modern architecture that has come up in, in in Kashmir, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps uh, one or two hotels near the boulevard because now that has become a huge industry mm-hmm. uh, in Kashmir and that probably is the only sort of economic uh, income that the, 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 the city gets uh, for a very long period of time in the year, uh, but just that, nothing else. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, I, would, uh, I was actually imagining your project there because it looks, you know, a a desperate cry for new modern architecture and there's a, a huge amount of context there which we can like really go, you know learn from and uh, i think there's a lot of potential especially in kashmir 
and in terms of modern architecture. So I was just visualizing your project there. And I think, you know, uh, one of uh, our viewers actually wrote this question to me. He was asking when you look back at your project, now that you're a practicing mm -hmm. architecture, what do you think about your project now in terms of its practicality and otherwise as well? Uh, so uh, this actually is a very interesting question because I was just the other day sitting and thinking about what I could have done uh, differently in a project of this kind. Uh, and uh, now after, after having practiced for almost three years out in the field, getting to know a lot more about how architecture is really made, uh, I feel like I would, I would definitely plan a lot of these buildings uh, a lot better to mm -hmm. be able to give the kind of experiences that I actually set out to give with the stories that I was writing. But those are very rudimentary in nature. And I think now after having gained that much experience of how things come together, of how things are built, the kind of politics that goes around the whole building of, of, of architecture and things like that, I would definitely would want to plan these buildings uh, a lot better, probably look at the semantic a little more closely. Uh, but I think having said that, I would definitely not shift my position from making architecture that is modern in, in, in the way it's planned but uses vernacular elements in, in the kind of semantic uh, that it, it, it puts forth to the city and for the people to kind of also digest the fact that these buildings are buildings that I have to go and use uh, uh, even now. I, I would not think of uh, a very modernist building with, uh, with materials that, you know, modern architecture traditionally, uh, sort of not traditionally speaking, but modern architecture finds itself using in, in, in the current context, which is concrete, uh, uh, steel, glass, uh, and not having, uh, not, not to say that modern architecture cannot really fuse well with, with uh, the vernacular, but, uh, but, but I think uh, the general perception of, of a lot of architects uh, within the country is that uh, somehow modern architecture has to be something that makes a statement, something that is uh, very large in scale, uh, something that is sort of, uh, how do you call it, has to be, uh, has to be grand uh, for some reason, and none of that would really work in a context like this. So I would definitely not move away from, uh, from uh, the kind of uh, semantic that I have gone ahead with in, in this project, but I would definitely want to plan things better. I would want to plan them uh, with a lot of added nuances, a lot of added experience, uh, a lot of spaces that would really be cherished by the people that actually use any of these buildings. So yeah, definitely. Nice. Um, another interesting question that a person wrote to me was, uh, this project was done in 2018 and you had the luxury of uh, traveling to Kashmir and it was, you know, back, you know mm. now that it's, uh, things have changed and especially amidst this uh, pandemic, uh, would you have done the same project? And if not, what kind of project would you have selected if it was a project to be done in 2020 or 21? Not at all, I think. Mm. I would not have been able to do this project at all during the time of the pandemic because everything that you see that I have shown in the presentation today has had some of the influence from the time of travel that I have had in Kashmir. Because I think it is it is the same with, uh, I think all architecture that all architects build, right? I mean, like even as architects, we always have to go and see the site. We have to see the surrounding of the site. We have to see the context. To be able to, in, 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 in true sense, make something that is contextual, in true sense, something that makes a difference to the context, whether it is through sustainability, whether it is using materials that come from within the context, whether it is using craft, from that particular context in the kind of building that you're making. And that just does not happen without you actually being there on site. And I think over the three years that I also have practiced, I have realized that uh, there are certain decisions that I make as an architect uh, that I make very intuitively. And that intuition is always sort of fueled when you're in that particular context, because it, it just doesn't happen otherwise, because you have to really feel uh, yourself, the kind of feelings that you get on site, also feel what who you're building for, uh, you know, and what, what they feel on site to be able to really make architecture that makes a difference. So I definitely would not have made uh, the same project if it was during the time of the pandemic. And to really ask me how, what I would have done as, the, as a thesis project in the time of the pandemic, I, I feel like I'm so crippled at this point to be able to answer that because uh, I don't know what I actually would have done. I perhaps should have just taken... Uh, a context that is accessible to me at this point, which is probably my neighborhood and, and, and done a project uh, in that particular thing. Because I'm very, I'm very, very certain that I would not have 
uh, taken our context that I would not be able to visit to be able to do a project there. Uh, but I, as having said that, I would not even start with a program immediately and say, okay, now because I have to do a thesis project, I would just decide a center for dash and dash, like a center for upliftment of women or a center for like craft or a center for art. I definitely would not have been able to do something like that uh, and just plonk a building on a site that I don't know where. Right. And another, another question that I have is regarding the uh, amount of research work that you did. Uh, when you're undertaking research, you're not quite particularly sure how that will inform you at the end of the project. So when you're mm. actually underdoing or undertaking the research, how do you streamline, you know, your focus, the amount of research? How do you conclude a research? Like, you know, this is, uh, you know, good enough and I can proceed with uh, whatever I have right now. Or how do you uh, direct yourself that, you know, this is what I need to document or this is what I need to know about. So can mm. you give some insights and how, how can, can you connect that thread and your end product as your thesis? So uh, I think Vivek, uh, having, uh, I think, thought about all of these things three years after having done this project, I feel like the research is uh, never ending. You know, it's not something that I can say that I started at this point and it's going to end because I now have to start designing a building. Uh, I think even now I, I'm very much interested and I still read about a lot of Kashmir history that, you know, I could not at that point uh, during thesis. I read a lot of about uh, conflict and reconciliation because now I think it has been internalized. It has become a part of me where, you know, I want to constantly inquire as to what are these ways that one can really help in contexts like these and I think Nagaland also was a part of the same inquiry and 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 surprisingly was done actually before I started with thesis so uh, to really say that Nagaland was uh, the basis of of what I did for my for my thesis project would be would, would in some sense be true uh, that it's a never-ending uh, process actually even now if I think uh, and, and I made the building because there was a requirement for that at, 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 at that point because I had to eventually design something and and give, but having given more time, I definitely would have liked to research a lot more about this context, about, about its architecture, about its people. And I'm sure there are lots and lots more of these social spaces that are in, in nooks and corners of the city that I haven't even been able to go to yet. You know, so uh, I, I don't think re research in some sense ever is finite. I think it's an infinite pool of thoughts, of arguments, of agreements, of, of criticism, of disagreements, of matter that comes your way unexpectedly. So it's, it's, it's serendipitous in that manner where, you know, suddenly something has come up and that has completely turned your research around and now you have a new lens of looking at things. And I think you have to embrace all of that while you're, while you're researching and, and you have to go with that. And I think that's what I did even during thesis where I didn't say I'm going to set out a path and one day I'm going to read one book or like today I'm going to do internet research or today I'm going to speak to somebody and formulate that interview. Uh, or anything for that matter. I would just like do what I felt like doing at that point. Some days I would just feel like not researching and making those drawings, uh, the maps of, of, of all the three parts of the city that you look at. But you see that even while doing the map, one really understands that part of the city so much better. You know, like the, the structure of the city, the kind of density, uh, the kind of way everything is flanked along the, the water body and how the whole system works along the water body for that matter. Uh, and, uh, and and it's very surprising to then realize that it's also because we are architects. It's also the the, the act of drawing that that uh, lets you think and lets you formulate your thoughts. And and that's one way that the architect communicates with the other. So I think research for me is all of this. It it actually is not finite at all. And and I think I'm not going to stop uh, being intrigued uh, or interested in researching topics that that you know I find interest in. Uh, till the end, I could probably formulate my thoughts and say that this is what I have come up with in this much time of having researched it, but that I don't think is the final product at all. Nice. Um, that's well said. And uh, one final question uh, regarding your thesis project. I think you've already answered it in which thesis, but I'm still going to go ahead and ask. So there was this uh, person who wrote to me, uh, what would, could you give some tips, advices for people who are taking their undergraduation thesis, thesis project. Uh, so what would be your uh, advice to them? Uh, like I think already mentioned earlier, I think you have to be extremely compassionate about the topic that you want to do because you also have to survive with it uh, for a year for people that want to finish it or for like people like me who want to take it forward and 
it has to be something that you attach yourself with for the rest of your life you know because this thesis project is one sort of juncture where you're actually moving from academia to then practice after and if that that sort of juncture is not sort of handled with as much sensitivity then uh, it could go either ways you know and i think that is one advice i would give to everyone who's trying to do thesis now is that don't think of a definitive program and start your project let it be a little loose and then let it be an inquiry saying that my advice to everybody who's doing thesis at this point would just be this that you know find something that you are feeling compassionate about something that you know you are interested in as an individual and try to make an argument about it don't try to just you know dumb down your entire project to being this one particular program that you have perhaps fancied for some time now and want to build for mm-hmm. because i think what is very important for us to realize is that we are building for people and it's their lives that we are you know uh, going to make these things for so i think it's very important to understand those things and and make an argument around that then to be able to design something so my advice to everybody trying to do thesis would be exactly this that first find what you're compassionate about first find what who you're building for whose voice you choose to represent while you're being an architect and then understand what they really want then to be able to design for them yeah thank you for that and uh, i want to ask have you taken this project forward um do you see yourself working in kashmir or this project do you see this project being realized is this like some ambition or goal that you have uh i definitely if if you'd ask me this question immediately after thesis order definitely said yes yes i you know my ambition in life is to get this project somehow sort of uh done uh, or or built in in that particular context and i would definitely want to see that at one point but i think as in when you spend some more time looking at what the kind of context there is the kind of governance that we have in this country at this point uh the chances of that seem more and more bleak not to say that i've completely uh kept that amb- ambition aside or the hope of that happening ever aside but it's definitely given me a more mature approach as to doing and making difference in people's lives not by just building but there could be other mechanisms of you know really trying to do that too uh and uh, if you ask me if i've taken this project forward essentially speaking in terms of architecture no but uh, if you are if, if i I've, i've definitely started researching a lot more i started making a lot more drawings because i want to formulate this uh, uh research that i have done and the kind of tool that we as architects have uh, the most that we have honed over the five years which is the tool of drawing uh, to be able to compile a a, a book for uh, a lot of people in general who are oblivious to what this context is about you know and if i if i'm even able to bring that one little story to somebody who doesn't really know anything about this particular context and and if if i see that person change his perception about that uh i think i have uh kind of not done enough but i have at least made a, sl- a slight difference and i think the way that i'm imagining that will happen at this point is through a compilation of a lot of these things that i think for me was self discovery at that point when i went to the context and i would definitely want that then going on to a lot of other people so just talking about these small things i think when my family looked at all of these things they were quite sensitized to the fact that you know there are certain things that we are oblivious of sitting on our couches here looking at the news uh from bombay but it's it's a completely different ball game to actually be there and 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 suffer what you're suffering on a daily basis and and for, and to me that is something uh that you know made a huge difference it was a, a big driving force to really do this project uh, uh well because if i could make a difference at least in the perception of people from the rest of the country uh as to the way that they view people from kashmir i think there is a lot of uh like that, then there's hope that there's a long way ahead that can actually you know like do something so i'm working on on a rather compilation of of uh, things uh, souvenirs and drawings from kashmir that i some day hope will come to everybody in the form of a book wonderful all the best for that i'm looking really forward to to that thank you out of your uh, um aspiration as well um i i would Thanks. like to move on to the next segment of this uh, podcast where we're going to talk about your project in nagaland definitely which, which is equally interesting so uh, back to you yeah sure yeah. so i'm saying nagaland actually happened by chance 
uh, and it's a very interesting story because the government of the governor of Nagaland at that point uh, was a part of the the mandal or the committee that that uh, governs <clears throat> our college in in uh, Mumbai. Uh, and he had this idea of getting two architects from Bombay to come and design a building in Nagaland for an indigenous tribe who wasn't finding appropriate uh, sort of representation in the society in Nagaland because Nagaland, I think, as a state has uh, 18 to 19 different tribes. They all have their different clothing. They all have the different ceremonies. They all have their different kind of food, uh, different rituals, different sort of... Uh, 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 natural forces that they worship to and i think uh, over the last couple of years what has happened is that there has been a lot of conversion within the entire state uh, of of these indigenous tribes into christianity because i think we also share a border uh, with other countries around uh, that uh, people find it uh, more convenient and more relatable to be able to then follow that particular religion not to say that any of that is wrong because i mean if you find yourself identifying with a certain religion, please go ahead and convert yourself. There's no absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what, what then has happened is that a lot of people that actually follow the indigenous religion uh, still uh, uh, do not find any representation uh, because there is a shift in the power uh, because of this sort of conversion that has happened in Nagaland. Uh, and uh, while I was doing this project, I was strictly told not to mention this at all because you know, it's the same thing as, as Kashmir saying, oh, but why are you saying this? You know, this is not the right thing to say. But this is the reality. And I mean, we as, as Indians, and I, I, I mean, the youth of India has to start, you know, really realizing that it's, it's high time we start talking about these things. Uh, so that the whole purpose of the project was to go there and really design a building for this small segment of society, which still sort of uh, followed uh, the Angami tradition, which is one of the tribes there at the follow, followed the indigenous, indigenous tradition. Uh, and we were asked to stay with them in their house for about two and a half months. Uh, we were asked to eat with them, eat the same food that they cooked. We were asked to live in their houses with their families, with with and follow all the traditions that they did uh, for go for all of their functions. Yeah, so uh, I think that was the whole idea of the project to really let these two kids that were going from Bombay shackle their entire perception of what you know like life is like. Uh, get to know and sensitize themselves to this real context that you know sometimes we don't even consider a part of our country it's the same case as Kashmir while I was traveling from Bombay to Nagaland there were so many people that actually came and asked me saying oh have you taken a visa to go there and I was like but why would I need that it's a part of the same country that we live in and they'd be like oh we didn't even know because it's like the northeastern most state so uh, you know I didn't think it was important to pay attention to at all because I live in Bombay I'm sitting on my couch here and I think I'm very comfortable so I don't need to care about the rest of the country uh, so it was it was a it was a big learning experience uh, uh, because of that because that that just makes you that just opens your eyes wide open to like something that you haven't paid attention to at all in in the 23 24 years that you've existed uh, when then when I was 23 years old so just to take you take everyone through this whole context so Nagaland uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of people don't know about extremely beautiful again like like uh, Kashmir uh, this is the entire city of Kohima this is the view from my window when I was staying with one of the the tribe members there uh, and, it, and you'll see that the vernacular here is again the kind of the hutment uh, typology which was not the vernacular back then where they had like really ordinate wooden houses that were made by each of the tribe members which you will now see only in the smaller villages or in the 10 day festival where, which Nagaland had which is a hornbill festival where you see a lot of people from outside the country and within the country coming in and getting to know of the context but the general sort of vernacular in the entire city now has become these tin sheds uh, and the rich now have started constructing these other houses which you see so there's sort of like a dichotomy of of what they've left behind in, in terms of their own culture and what they're aspiring to be because I think their aspiration in two-tier cities always exists when they see imagery of, uh, of, of, of the first-tier cities, of, of these maximum cities like Bombay, Kolkata, uh, that they aspire to be like that and their aspiration always sort of lingers along in whatever that they do, whether it is their fashion, whether it is the kind of clothing, whether it is kind of the food that they want to make and sell. So that so so Nagaland and Kohima is actually at the brink of that, you know, where they want to uh, attach themselves to uh, that culture, 
that they have they have been brought up with but they also want to aspire to be something that they are not which is which is an aspiration of of coming from a a, a first year city so i think that is something that was very very evident while we were there uh this is the war cemetery so uh, uh, nagaland also has a very sort of large history of of uh, armed rebellion and being a part of uh, wars and things like that so this is just a, a remembrance of or something like that and this is the kind of uh, ornate uh, imagery i'm talking about and this is what you will find on every single house when one really goes to the smaller villages where a lot of these tribes now live and you realize that they are so culturally rich that they are so sort of uh, uh, involved with nature one with nature where they are making uh, everything out of the natural resources available that they are praying to all of these natural forces where they are praying to their mother their father the cosmic connection the universe the animals the trees uh, whatever gives them food is what they are praying to and i think that is that is sort of very well represented in all of these scrolls uh, and 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 these large sort of uh, carvings that each of these people have uh, on their houses or community buildings etc this again is uh, 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 a procession that they have during one of their functions and you can see how vibrant their dresses are uh, their jewelry is uh the kind of use of feathers whatever that they find within the context the wool that has been then woven into making these shawls which are really thick so they also give them some sort of warmth because nagaland tends to get extremely cold uh again another this is this is another tribe and and you see a complete shift in the in the garment in in the way that they dress up in the way their feathers are and where their head gears are so it's so tenacious to look at all of these things that in the first one month you were like oh wow this is like you know like wonderland for us but uh because we were obviously from outside and we hadn't seen something like this before but when you, when then you become a part of their daily lives you realize that this is what was available to them this is the kind of resource that was available to them and they made their lives around that now times are changing and now they're developing and now they have a certain another sort of uh, what to say like way of of bringing in money into the state but earlier they were all all hunters they were all uh worshippers of the nature and that's how they've sort of made their lives revolve around all of those things and it was very important to understand that before the building even was started to be designed so uh just a couple of more images of just uh, these headgears and their their sort of dresses and um uh, you know uh, i think because we are architects we are a little more observant of all of these things uh but you don't realize that the, these things get carried with you subconsciously uh, subconsciously you know even when you start with the design of the project later that you always have these images that you that immediately come as flashbacks to you because they are so vivid that you actually start designing with all of these things in mind and i think uh, that is one thing that makes architecture really beautiful because architecture is informed not just by sight but it's informed by art it's informed by music it's informed by culture it's informed by uh, by fashion it's informed by uh, uh rituals it's informed by uh even religion sometimes you know uh then this is the context this is the economy that they have that they all rice paddy field farmers that they have their own big rice paddy fields with the house perched on top of the hill and the the paddy fields are just descending down again some of these houses they have these large sort of drums where they store a lot of their grains in they still follow the traditional method of cooking which will still be blowing air into logs of wood and making the fire and then cooking on top of that they use a lot of meat which is air dried so they will have their poultry which is then sort of dried uh, for months and months air dried in their house uh, and then sort of boiled and, and and eaten so the way of living is is sort of completely different from the way of living that we are used to in the city the way of cooking is very different their delicacies are very different the kind of resources that they use to cook are very different uh they realize that they don't get too many spices there which is why they use only salt and 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 chili which is the 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 spiciest chili in the world is the naga chili so they use that chili uh they know that they don't have any grain except rice there so so their diet doesn't include wheat at all uh so even while we were staying there uh we could not find atta we could not find rotis we always had to eat rice with some sort of boiled vegetable uh also you don't have lots of vegetables growing there uh vegetables in terms of like vegetables that we are used to eating like the like onions like tomatoes etc so you don't find gravies there you will find uh seed vegetables you will find pumpkin you will find gourds you will you will find uh vegetables like those 
which go well with watery soup. So they'll make their vegetables like that. Uh, they'll have bamboo shoots that they'll use to start cooking. So the whole culinary sort of experience is completely different in a place like this from all the other sort of places within the country that we probably must be visiting as tourists. So I think it was it was a very very different experience for me while I was being in that context. And I was just trying to absorb all of that. The point of this exercise not was not to make just a design and give it to them in 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 fifteen days, but to really absorb these things and then design with all of these things internalized within your system. Uh, so this is this is the site. Uh, it's on a hill uh, with a very very steep slope. Uh, and we like to call the project the Kohima Portfolio. Jafufiki Futsana Keseko is actually the name of the organization uh, of the indigenous tribes that have come together to be able to uh, at least get their voices heard. Uh, so this was the site. Again, there were no resources to go and measure draw this site correctly. We didn't have a dumpy. We didn't have a surveyor. So we literally had to resort on like the old traditional techniques of actually using bamboo to measure heights and getting the contours correctly. Uh, uh, you'd be surprised that they also had their own serving sort of uh, uh, methods. And we learned those from the tribes because uh, they make a lot of their houses on, on a lot of these uh, perched on hilltops. So they obviously have to get the levels correct. Uh, so those, those traditional techniques were used. Uh, a lot of dialogue had to happen between us and the, the entire community because uh, language was a huge barrier. But luckily, the person from the tribe that we were staying with had had his, his education in Bihar. So he had at least understood Hindi, if not English. So we had to explain to him in Hindi and then he would explain it to the rest of the tribe in Nagamis uh, or Angami for that matter, which are two very different languages actually. Uh, and then they would respond to it. And sometimes from the response, we'd know, okay, fine, this is, you know, something that they've liked and something that they've not liked. Uh, so that whole community participation was very, very evident in the whole process. Uh, and that's how we sort of went on to make whatever that we designed for them. And so this is the kind of building that we designed for them. And they had basically only come back to us saying that they wanted a prayer hall, that they didn't want anything else, that they wanted just a hall, which gave them an opportunity to come and pray to all the forces of nature that they do and do functions uh, like Sekhrani, which is like their annual function where they pray to the sun god uh, and do all of those functions. But I think over, over a period of time after having lived with them for so long and after having seen them grapple with even the daily sort of businesses and things like that, we realized that it was important for them to learn certain vocations, which they were not being able to get access to uh, because of, of being in a certain strata of society now, because they're the only leftover indigenous tribes that remain, uh, there was very important for us to incorporate that program along with this. Also give them some sort of uh, uh, some sort of program that gets in a uh, uh, daily income to be able to then maintain this building and then provide for the people that were actually working within this building. So the whole program then not only became a prayer hall, but became like a level of... Uh, a vocational training center, it became a library, it became a small life homestay hotel uh, and dormitory is where people coming from uh, different uh, cities would come and, and stay with them and kind of go through their hospitality like we did uh, and things like that. Uh, so that's how the building was designed. Uh, if you see a lot of the references of the kind of forms that have come from, have come from the kind of architecture that already exists or the kind of headgears we saw uh, the kind of imagery we had or like parts of their jewelry or parts of like the horns that they used or parts of their dresses uh, and things like that. So, so this was the whole elevation uh, of the building. And I think uh, also because we had limitation in terms of construction material being used, uh, we resorted to the natural material, which was the basalt stone that was available there, the bamboo that was very widely available for construction there and the natural jungly wood that comes from the forest that these guys use even to make their own houses. Uh, this was a section through the community hall with the basement being used for parking and a lot of uh, vocational training because even here, uh, by, by the fact that I'm saying vocational training doesn't mean that I'm teaching them a certain kind of art, I'm teaching them music, I'm teaching them craft. I'm actually teaching them how to be a mechanic. <clears throat> I'm actually teaching them how to be a good electrician. I'm, I'm teaching them how to be, how to ride their own vehicle so they can have their cars and become at least somebody who can drive people around and earn their living through that because these guys are absolutely not educated because education is just not given importance to uh, in, in a society of this kind. And they're not even given opportunity now because they're the followers of the indigenous uh, traditions still. Uh, that that uh, saying that I'm going to suddenly make him a pop star 
is just not going to work or i'm going to make him an artist is just not going to work so you know you have to give them certain techniques certain knowledge uh, first for them to find their feet and once they've done that is when they'll start developing on that to then go and do whatever that they want to ahead so that was the whole motive of of uh, the vocational training within the building too these are some more sections of the whole building with the dormitory uh, and like larger pavilions for a uh, lot of these vocational training uh, to happen and things like that uh, and at the same time because we were so closely attached to them and we were seeing all of their functions we just thought it would be nicer to take these functions to a notch higher where you know you, they had like formalized invitations to call people they had formalized invitations now because we knew the mayor uh, sorry the, the governor and the mayor both to go and invite them for their functions to be for them to at least feel like we are being acknowledged as a part of the same state uh, uh, whether we you know uh, are uh, economically or socially at the same foot as as everybody else is so our efforts were as small as this where we designed a, a, a card for them an invitation card for them that went on to about 300 people in the state and we actually had a lot of them coming in for that festival and became one of the largest talk festivals uh, during that time in nagaland uh where a lot of even uh government dignitaries came in because the invitations were sent to them and they were so formalized in nature i think these small small things really gave them that confidence that tomorrow if now the building is made and if we don't have anybody holding our hand at least we'll be able to survive ourselves and to be able to give that impetus to the next generation to not suffer the kind of the suffering that we have had but to go ahead and then then do what they they, they really have to and and even education became a large thing because the minute we said we wanted to make a library they said okay fine we'll, we'll start uh, you know gathering books already of of literature that has been written in the local languages literature that has been written in assamese because that's the closest other state um uh, guwahati and 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 places where a lot of these naga kids go to study uh they say we'll get literature in english because now they've they've been influenced by that western culture that they've all started reading english they all started dressing up like that so there was in some sense that sort of excitement that then built up just by our presence and then and you know you then realize that you're you're just a mere instrument in getting this done that they already had the capacity of you know doing all of these things themselves your mayor just pushing them to do it and i think that's what uh, our job was more than actually designing or getting the building made uh and, and i think it was a great experience right now we're currently working on getting quotations for capital goods and and the construction of the building and things like that uh we had applied last year to get funding to get this building at least started but unfortunately we couldn't because the csr uh companies couldn't give us the kind of funds that we were looking at but uh we are uh constantly trying and and i hope one day we get the funds to actually make this building happen uh in nagaland i'm really uh, amused and fascinated by this entire approach and the story behind this project uh really really interesting i want to ask do you have um, like through this channel or somebody can can anybody come and approach you in terms of funding like maybe we can spread the word across uh is there any i'd be i'd be more than glad actually if somebody yeah. got in touch with me because all the resources that we have had we've sort of gone to one tried but we've not had any luck with those mm -hmm. also not to mention uh i did not do this project alone specifically i had a very very uh supportive uh, friend who also traveled with me and he was also selected from college called Tanmay Nawar mm -hmm. who I could not have done this project without so I think both of our efforts are towards getting this project uh, at least uh, started in some sense mm -hmm. uh, but we've not had the momentum to really do that because we've not had the resources uh, to simply put it but I think our our efforts that to really find that sort of resource that can help us do that and if through this channel if anybody is watching and really is interested in doing something like this i'd be more than glad if you can get in touch uh, and we can kick start this project because i think it's it's these kind of projects that really are going to bring uh, the youth of our country at at a, at at the footing where you know we won't have to look back and i think that's what we really need at this point uh but yeah i'd i'd be more than happy if somebody got in touch through this medium yeah i'm going to put some details about this project in the description um so that people sure. can approach you and then i would really love to take this project uh, ahead if i can uh, contribute through this channel or if somebody can reach uh, to you through this so but very very, That's very kind of you no, no problem very kind of you very, very fascinating you. really really interesting and 
a lot and lot the, the imagery was like really fantastic uh, seeing the entire uh, process which was driven through the local tribes and then you coordinating it mm. this in itself is a huge task uh, you know communicating and getting uh, through with all of that but uh, again quite very interesting uh, i hope this uh, is taken forward in the coming years um but uh, i like we're running short of time but if you can quickly go I know, I'm sorry i took up too much time no it's no problem but if we can quickly go through the final segment of this uh, podcast of uh, your uh, experience uh, um helping and uh, tutoring your uh, at set uh, with your uh, uh, principal architect samir rathod who's taking up a studio there right now yeah so uh, i think teaching is something that i have been very interested in since uh, i went and interned uh because this is a- so uh, teachers at every point in time whether it is in college or whether it is uh, when you are working and you have your seniors sort of telling you exactly how things are done then it's very important to have somebody who really makes a difference in your life and and i've had uh, the the luck actually to have had teachers like uh, rohan shiv kumar sonal sundar rajan uh, even samira rathod for that matter who's been a great great sort of support it is very important to have a uh, a uh, good teachers uh, that you know uh, not not just uh, open up an array of 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 thoughts in front of you but actually mold you to critically think and analyze everything uh, before you actually set out to do something and i think i've had the great luck of being tutored by some fantastic teachers like uh, rohan whatever that i have done um outside of office and within office uh and i think that is what really then molds you to becoming an architect who is a critical thinker at the same time as as somebody who who's designing and building things and i think that is what the need of the hour is because we don't need more uh, <coughs> sorry we don't need more uh, architects to go out there and say okay this is what i'm telling you to do and this is what needs to be done and i think uh, these these people have been very instrumental in in all of these projects that i have done so i think that really got me to thinking of 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 uh, the fact that even i want to teach at some point so i i first got a chance to be an uh, a, a teaching assistant with uh, rohan shiv kumar uh, at kamla reja where i did a studio with him for an entire year and seven other tutors uh, and that was my first sort of experience with uh, with teaching and i think that's something that was so enriching because it's not just you telling them what to do but there are so many ideas then when you become a teacher that you come across that there's so much learning that even you have when you're interacting with your students i'm currently doing a studio with uh, samira rathod uh, at sept uh, called the architecture of nuances so uh, in that particular studio we are actually uh, looking at the power of the small we're looking at how architecture is not just always about the large things that we want to do uh obviously it is concept driven for a lot of architects but also is about the form it's about it's about uh fenestration it's about materiality it's about a lot of small things that actually offer you an experience within the building that while sometimes making uh you know large pieces of architecture we tend to neglect or lose uh but we really need to have so poetic space is something that has become a very important backing uh to the studio that we are currently working on uh and we've got a, a fabulous bunch of about uh, nine kids who are grappling with this idea of you know how does one uh could what memory into a form then into the architecture so we've got them to do exercises like uh make abstract drawings of the kind of memories you've had from childhood of being in a certain space to actually dismantling objects and making them into smaller other objects which are like small machines um uh, then how those machines have a certain kind of derivative form from the already kind of broken up objects and the kind of little parts of the of, of those objects that you've taken then how does how does that form sort of in, uh, inform the form that you're doing for the architecture uh, that you're making on site and and having done all of these poetic sort of exercises with them we not definitely neglected the more pragmatic uh, exercises within architecture which is obviously looking at site Uh, coming up with a master master plan of how things are going to work when this building is made coming up with a master plan of your particular site uh, accesses uh, service 
of things. But I think what is very important and what lacks in a lot of education in India during architecture, when architecture is taught, is this layer of 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 the of of uh, the poetics or something that sublime that you know one really needs to bring into what they what they are making. It doesn't always have to be a set sort of. Uh, pattern or a set sort of uh, structure to every every piece of architecture that you make that it always has to be uh, about the program about the function about these many people coming in about the corridor with being this much about the window always having to be at this height but there are certain uh, like i even mentioned earlier that i am a strong believer that architecture does not have the power to make social change but it has the power to offer a variety of experiences that no other sort of art uh, has because of the kind of space uh, it has and uh, because of that uh, i think uh, uh, this sort of exploration of of what the small details within architecture can do of how light can be brought in of how materials come together of how a certain fenestration has to be of how your choreographing exactly uh, how a user moves from one space into another is very important i think that's what we're dealing with in the studio so it's very interesting because it's it's, it's definitely a big learning curve even for me right uh, and on that note um, thank you so much uh, jay for doing this episode clearly we have understood not one episode was enough to cover the wide range of things that you are <laughs> being a part of i hope we can connect again for another episode sometime maybe in season 2 uh, but this was an absolute joy going through the and the wide gamut of things that you've been a part of and being associated of um so definitely i had so many questions uh, from our viewers as well uh, we i'm try to answer as many as of them possible um, but i'll try to forward some of these questions in case if you find any time to answer them and uh, we could uh, put those up as well but thank you so much once again and on this uh, um, i'm going to conclude it on this note but thank you so much for uh, offering your time and for doing this thank you thank you so much vivek i, I think i've had a great time talking about these things and i think even i would have liked to answer a lot more questions actually but uh, the presentations only took up too much time and i have a general habit of talking a little extra <laughs> no problem so <laughs> no problem so uh, that uh, but uh, but yeah I, i definitely would like to keep in touch and see if there's anything i can do do send me all the questions and i'll try to answer them today itself sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me yep thank you so much jay um...